Okay, we're about to enter a Bible study this morning in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. But before we begin, we're going to allow a few moments of silent time where you can pray and represent yourself before the throne of grace. Time to use the rebound technique if needed. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We're in Ephesians 4.22, and I'm going to read it to you in my New King James. It says, that you put off, that word put off means to change a piece of clothing, concerning the, old, the former conduct, which is either you as an unbeliever or in reversionism, the old man, and that's the old man and his clothing. The rest of the chapter we saw includes a lot of the clothing of the old man. Things like anger, wrath, malice, rage, uh, on and so forth. Which grows corrupt. And that word grows is the expanding, the pressure from the lust pattern of the sin nature. According to deceitful lusts and we began to look at the lust pattern of the sin nature last week I forgot to give my uh, preliminary uh, spill last week and I went right into the lust pattern we had been connecting this thing together and I wanted to show you where we've made it so far we begin to look at breaking the dominance of the old sin nature. And as a born-again Christian, you can operate in two different spheres, if you will. You can either operate in the sphere of the fresh, flesh, or you can operate in the sphere of the Spirit. That's where God wants you. How can we break the dominance of the flesh, the old sin nature as it's called, out there in carnality? Number one, you've got to learn how to operate by God's power. And that is only available when you operate clean from the priesthood. It's called rebound. 1 John 1, 9. God's given you a priesthood, we saw. Satan rejected his priesthood. God gave you one to prove that he is right and he is just. And that you would follow his plan. And Satan could have but did not. And therefore... He's gave us protocols for the priesthood, and the first protocol is operate clean without defilement. And the only way we can do that in the spiritual life is stay confessed up to date. We covered that. Secondly, you need to unleash another power in your life, and it's the power of your word, of the word of God. And <clears throat> that can only be done by Bible study. We use an acrostic called the grace apparatus for perception. That means anybody can learn the word of God. All you have to be is a plugger. All you have to do is stick with it. And when you learn the word of God, then the Holy Spirit has some ammunition. As a baby believer, you've got very little doctrine in your soul. And God the Holy Spirit has very little material to which to use in your life. And so for you, the idea is that learn as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And if you're in babyhood in your spiritual life, that means that you go through the crash program. The crash program. And the crash program says that, that you spend every waking hour thinking about doctrine and the questions that you may have about doctrine and get those questions answered. When I first began to study, I would listen to a tape. I'd write down all of my questions on the left side of my notebook and all of my notes on the right side of my notebook. And wouldn't you uh, believe it that by the time I made it to the next tape, I could flip over to all my questions and start striking them out because they were consistently answered as I progressed. I answered that question I had wrote down three pages ago. Let me strike that out. 
and I would keep going. And my questions kept getting deeper and deeper. But guess what? The farther I went, the more answers I received. And at the breakfast table, guess what I had? Doctrine. At lunchtime, guess what I had? Doctrine. After I finished work, guess what I was studying? Doctrine. While I was at work, guess what I had playing? Doctrine. And I went through the crash program and I told myself, I am going to get a handle on this thing. I want to understand it. And until you want to, you won't. See, you're doing exactly what you want to do. It's called volition. And so, as a baby believer, the utmost priority is getting that train moving out of the station, getting ahead of steam built, get heading in the right direction, get those answers. You all, you got tons of questions. Get those things answered. And get that train moving out there towards super grace. And once you get your feet under you, then you can join in some Bible classes and you actually begin to get something out of it. You say, oh, I've heard that before. Oh, I've seen that in the notes before. And now let's fill in some gaps here. So if you want to break the dominance of the sin nature in your life, the first two points are of utmost priority. First, you've got to learn how to unleash the power of the Spirit in your life by operating clean. And then secondly, you've got to unleash the power of God's Word in your life by learning it. So that's gap. Then we saw we need to understand the identification and reckoning truths. And so... <clears throat> Modern psychology has it wrong. The Bible has it right. God created the human soul and he knows what it needs. Modern psychology says you've got to learn how to love all of you. Every bit of you, even the bad parts. The Bible says no. The Bible says that God the Father drove nails through your old man 2,000 years ago. That's what he thought of him. And therefore, we see the old man as God sees him, crucified, dead, and buried. But there's a good part of you. And there's, see, that's the second part. That's the second reckoning that we live in the victory of the resurrection and that our new man, is it, it, it receives the victory not only of the resurrection in Christ emerging from the grave victorious, but the fact that he ascended through the heavenlies and led captivity captive. See, that's your destiny. The first part of three Ambrose has been fulfilled. You're going to take part in the second part. But now he is seated at the right hand of God the Father in the place of power and authority and your real life is hidden there in Christ. See, your real life's not on Facebook. Your real life's not on Instagram. Your real life is hidden in Christ as he's seated in the heavenlies. How much have you invested there? What have you put in that account? See, that's your real life and that's your real destiny. And every one of us as born-again Christians is going to follow Christ back in the second advent where the, the spiritual battle, which is now hidden behind the curtains, will be revealed for what it really is. Who will be the mature sons of God then? Who will be the winners? And I guarantee you there's somebody in a wheelchair right now who is a winner. And he's an invisible hero. And he is going to mount up on that victory horse and he is going to lasso one of those demons who's higher up on the list. Can you get me? We don't know who the mature sons of God, 
they shall be revealed on that day. That's your destiny. That's the real you. So the Bible tells us who we really are in Christ. We're more than victors. We're overcomers. And we share in the victory of resurrection. And we share in the victory of the first advent. That's our destiny. You see, the Bible has it right. And biblical psychology is right psychology. God created the human soul and he knows what it needs to thrive. Then we began to look at knowing the lust patterns of the old sin nature. We under, and that, that allows you to understand motivations in life. And this is where we're studying at right now. Now what you found out so far is that the baby believer has hardly any hope of breaking the dominance of the sin nature. Only when they walk into Bible class and they hear the pastor say, now we're going to have a time where you can rebound if you need to, they say, oh, wow, I forgot. I, yeah, I do. I need to pray. I need to confess my sins and get up to date. When they walk out the door, it's so long, see you, God. And their only hope in life is making it to that next Bible class. See, that's the next right decision that they will make is getting back into class and hearing the pastor say, now we're going to have a time of rebound. You know what the first bad decision that they will make is? Skipping Bible class. First bad decision. Their pastor's not there to remind them. Use the rebound technique and let's learn some doctrine. And they go out into the tulies and they get in every briar, every piece of barbed wire, every mud hole, every landmine. They get out there and they get ragtag in life and blown up to, sh to shreds and they wonder, why is my life so hard? You're born again and God loves you. And he, want, he doesn't want to see you out in the tulies. He doesn't want to see you in a faraway land. He wants to bring you home, place of fellowship. He wants to kiss you on the neck. He wants to uh, share in his word with you and all of his riches. And so, therefore, Bible class is the place to return to as a prodigal child. And we won't blame you. And when you're blown to smithereens and you're ragtag and you've been cut by the barbed wire and, all, and you're all scratched up from the briars of the world, we receive you with open arms and we smile and say, I'm so glad you're back. You found the place where you can rest. We're going to put some signs out here, and one of my signs is going to say, this is where prodigal sons return. You see, if you've been blown to smithereens by life, this is a place of rest where you can get away. So the lust patterns and understanding the motivations of life is where we are now. I need to share one more thing. My son showed me how this thing. I didn't learn good enough. Let me stop sharing. I'll have to take a review. I had to see it at least three times. I wanted you to have this uh, diagram kind of etched in your memory. When we take a look at the sin nature in illustration, this is how we illustrate it. You can't really illustrate it because it contaminates every cell of your human body. And therefore, uh, when we try, when we share this illustration, we're doing the best we can. It can't be exact, and that's uh, the way it is in the spiritual life many times. The sin nature has an area of weakness where you're tempted to produce personal sin. It has an area of strength where you produce human good. The sin nature also has lust patterns, and this is the pressure outwards, either towards antinomianism, that means lawlessness, immoral degeneracy, or towards legalism, asceticism, or 
sweetness and light. Do goodism. Holier than thouism. Go on. And this is moral degeneracy. So, in illustration, you get an idea of these things that we're studying. We're looking at the lust pattern right now. It's the pressure outward. It is calling you to action, whether you obey or not, is your decision. Let's go now. Add to. No, I didn't share. We began to look at Scripture. I gave you a definition last week. You have that PowerPoint, Cody. Insatiable desire is a way I like to shortcut the definition of lust. If you follow the flesh, you'll have insatiable desires, and you have to fall into them. The bad news is, is that the unbeliever has no other means of life. He simply toggles between giving in to areas of weakness to being motivated by lust patterns and then toggling over to human good. He is simply in the flesh. He has no other recourse. The believer, however, has options. And you as a Christian can operate in the flesh, that's out there in carnality with unconfessed sin in the life. Or you can rejoin fellowship, be confessed up to date and operate in the sphere of the spirit. So we have a definition, the insatiable desire, the pressure outwards. I want to skip forward to the point where we are. We took on Last week, some verses, we had an introduction, and then we looked at the parable of the sower, and we saw that <clears throat> the seed that fell by the wayside Jesus says, and the cares of this world, that's Satan's system, and the deceitfulness of riches, that's monetary lust, and the lust of other things, that's materialism lust, etc., choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. And so that means you've got your uh, scale of values and your priorities wrong. When you have the Word of God in top priority, you overcome these things. So this is part, this is an excerpt from the parable of the sower, and I told you I was so proud of you all. You have proven that you are the seed sown on fertile ground. Just the fact that you are here proves that the seed has fell on fertile soil. Do you know why? Because we don't do religious activities in this church. There are mega churches that have a coffee bar where you can go in and order your mocha latte supreme with all of the things. And people are there just for the coffee. There are churches that have a band, I mean a full band, with all kinds of instrumentation and amplification and you feel like you're at a concert and people are there just for the music. And then people go for a social life and they say, well, we're going to separate all of these people into groups and we're going to send the singles here and the hopefuls here and the college students here and the seniors here. And, uh, and so it's a lonely hearts club and you get to join your group and you get to sob about your sob story. And then the people who sell things go there. And if you're an insurance salesman, you go in and you dress your best and you put in a big smiling face and you introduce yourself to possible clients and used car salesmen 
and dentists and automotive mechanics and everyone goes to the church to meet clientele. And it goes on and on, whether people want an emotional uh, experience or religious experience, maybe they want to walk the aisle in front of everybody every week and do whatever it is that receive approbation lust. So there's all kinds of wrong motivation, but guess what? We chopped all of that by sticking to Bible doctrine. When you come in here and you see us not singing, there's a reason. We're not here for music. If you need music, listen to it on the way to church. I like music. It primes the soul. Study. But guess what? You can turn it on in your car on the way here, and you can get primed up and ready for Bible class. So on and so forth. We're only here for one reason. We cut to the chase, and I love you all because you are fruitful seed. You are the seed that fell on fertile soil. One day we're going to find out. Here's what you're going to find out. Jesus says, if you give so much as a cup of cold water in my name, you shall receive reward. And did you know the time that you spend in Bible class in fellowship has eternal reward attached to it? Jesus says, God's word, my word, will never return void. That means you have found the monopoly of life. And that means that every moment that you spend in Bible class, that you have, in fact, you have extrapolated the meaning of life and that God is going to have a reward for you in eternity that you cannot even contemplate in time the greatness thereof. That's what the Bible says. And when it, the Bible says the seed fell on fertile soil, that's you. I am the sower in this dispensation as the pastor teacher. You are the seed. The fertile soil is positive volition, Bible doctrine. And so you have beaten out the lust pattern. And the first way to do that is your attitude towards Bible doctrine. Let's move on to a new verse. <clears throat> Titus 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared, that's Jesus Christ, bringing salvation to all men. That means that God is not willing that any should perish, but all that would come to a repentance or change of mind about Christ. God made a way for every member of the human race to be saved. In other words, unlimited atonement instructing us, that's after salvation, to deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that's Satan's system, and to live sensibly. That means that you live morally, that you live logically, and that you use reason sensibly. Righteously, that means you operate in the bottom circle, and godly, that means you live out the life of Christ. Anytime you see godliness, it means live out the life of the Lord. In the present age, that's the dispensation in which we live, the church age. So deny worldly lusts. And I want to stop and tell you, there is an allure in Satan's system. Satan can promote who he wants to. He can put his people up at the top of the heap. He can give them riches. He can give them fame. He can give them fortune. He can give them social class. There's an old proverb that says, Satan often appears as a beautiful angel. Everything in which you would want. See, Satan can promote who he wants to in this life. But I'll give you a warning. He throws them away at the end. When they're no longer useful. Here's what's amazing. Jesus gives reward to those who give a cup of cold water in his name. You can sacrifice your whole life for Satan and get thrown away and go to hell forever. 
Would that say you're playing on the wrong team if you're playing with darkness? So Satan can promote who he wants to and be careful of those who have fame and fortune in this life. There are a few out there who give glory to God and uh, are in few between. Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus. There's that phrase, put on. It means to put on like a piece of clothing. It not only means to put on the thinking of the Lord through doctrine, but to put on the clothing of the Lord like the fruit of the Spirit. Peace, joy, love. And make no provision for the flesh. See, that's the opposite. In regard to its lust, epithemia, the pressure outwards. First Peter 1 Peter 1.14, Peter says, As obedient children, they were saluting God and his authority. I like it because it calls God our father, and we are royal family members, children. Do not be conformed to the former lust. We're going to take a look at what these former lusts are, which were yours in ignorance. Now, this verse gives you some psychology too because what this tells us is that we were, as we grew up in the world, we learned how to handle our problems as they came up and many times it was wrong in other words let me give you a vivid example somebody comes to you and they're angry they're mad and the old man his system of dealing with someone mad is to get madder than they are, meaner than they are, more uh, wrathful than they are. And the old man, when someone comes in and they're angry, and you say, oh, you want to be angry at me? And the old man bows up and said, I can be angry too. As a matter of fact, I will, I'll call you and I will beat you in your anger. And so... This situation escalates, and then their old man gets puffed up, and guess what? Before you know it, they're, you're throwing fists in the Walmart parking lot. But the new man has agape love, and it's a relaxed mental attitude, free from mental attitude sins. And when you see someone approaching, and they're full of anger, you put on a smile, and you say, I'm the Clint Eastwood of the Christian life. I am calm, cool, and collected. Calm. That's what Bruce Lee would say. And so you say, I'm sorry you're having a bad day. I can tell that something's gone terribly wrong. And I just want to, I want to let you know God loves you. The Lord loves you. I'll pray with you if you want me to. You can get over this, this spit of anger. This is just, just part of your day that you can step right through and get through. See how opposite that is, the new man? And see, the old man has a habituated reaction. He learned how to handle angry people in kindergarten on the playground. This is when Tommy came up and he was being mean. You just got meaner. But see, you had to learn something different in the Christian way of life. And that's habituating a new man response. We're going to learn that. You have to do it 20 times in a row before... You can do it subconsciously. So Peter is telling us we were formed from childhood growing up and we, we succumb to the flesh. We just learn how to deal with life as it came up. But when you hit the Christian way of life, you're going to have to stop and think and say, okay, this is not God's way to handle the problem. What is God's way? And then you learn the protocol for handling situations God's way. And that's when pain comes because change is painful. We'll learn all these things. Jude one eighteen. That they were saying to you in the last times there will be mockers. 
following after their own ungodly lusts. That means they say, oh, oh, that Bible was written by a bunch of camel riders thousands of years ago. I can't believe you, you follow that. You believe that stuff. See, they're mocking your faith. You know what your answer is? Well, maybe when the other 40% of Bible prophecy comes true, you'll believe too. You see, see, over 60% of Bible prophecy has already been fulfilled with great accuracy, I might add. We saw some of it Wednesday night, looking at Daniel. Oh, you have to be ready for the mockers. And uh, we live in faith. And it, the, the unbelieving world and the uh, reversionist believers... The only reason they mock your faith is because they're under conviction a little bit on the inside anyway, and they've, they're really fighting themselves, and uh, they're placing their own failure and flaws on you and attacking them there, and that's one of their favorite methods. Following after their own ungodly lusts. We're going to look at those lusts. 1 John 2.16 for all that is in Satan's system. I didn't understand. This verse had me convicted as an as a, uh, immature believer so badly because I do race car engines and I do race cars. And when I saw this verse, I, I believed I needed to sell everything I had and go live in a cave. That's not it. You see, the word world here is cosmos. And it means Satan's organized system. And once you have that definition of world or cosmos here, you get a lot better understanding of the verse and, and you can actually apply it. What's this? For all that is in Satan's organized system. And you don't want part of it. It's darkness. Don't sell out to the devil. The lust of the flesh. We're looking at all the different lust patterns of the sin nature. That's what's indicated here. And the lust of the eyes. That's materialism lust. Sex lust. Uh, all of the things that come through the eyes. And the boastful pride of life. Remember that man has two main motivations. Inordinate competition, that's I'm going to beat you. And inordinate ambition, that is I hate you. That's when you see man out here functioning, that's what most of his motivation is. You say, well, what's your motivation? Love for the Lord ought to be your motivation in life. It's not from the Father but is from Satan's organized system. So, I've made it far enough now where we get to get right to the nuts and bolts of this thing and we begin to uh, understand what the lust pattern of the sin nature is. We're going to have 12 different lust patterns and you're going to find out what drives people out here. What is driving people in life? What is their motivation? Don't let it be yours. Point number one is materialism lust. And you could, you could almost form another category underneath this, electronic lust. There are so many gizmos now. You could be forever collecting them. I have to make application here in the hot rod world. There's endless options for horsepower. With all the technology coming out, you can be forever collecting hot rod parts. I have overcome some of this by reverting backwards. I used to want to go as fast as possible. And now I, I try to see as how cheaply I can do it. And usually that's by rummaging around and finding something nobody else wanted and fixing it. And that 
That's fun too. Materialism, lust, whatever it is, houses, cars, lands. Jesus says, store your treasure, treasure in heaven, not where the thief can steal, the moth can eat, and the fire can destroy. You see, how sad would you be if you lost everything you own? And Jesus knew the rich young ruler was suffering under materialism lust because uh, the rich young ruler said, Lord, I've, I've followed every command. What should I do now? And he said, sell all you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And since the rich young ruler was suffering under materialism lust, he said, oh, my brand new racing camel. My brand new hair, my, my tent made of the black goat hair. All of my servants, my cattle, my horses, my sheep. All of the fine things in life. But Jesus says, he who he finds the way, who gives up his life for the Lord and uh, follows him. And did you know that has a simple application to us? It is that Bible doctrine is number one on our scale of values. And that everything else is in second place. And it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy nice things. Paul says, I have learned how to be content whether I have much or have little. And when he said much, he had dined in the finest restaurants in the world. He had the filet mignon. He had the red wine. He had the finest waiters and servants. And uh, things, if you will, medicines, uh, all of the adornments of being well off or well to do Paul had them he knew what the fine line look Paul had been to every sporting event that you could ever imagine he went to the Olympic games he went to the Pythian games he went to the Isthmus games he saw all of the athletes and he wrote about it in the Bible entertainment he saw uh, the plays the orchestras all the different finer things of life. He had gained weight. We call it bulking in the uh, physical activity world. But he says, I also know how to be content with very little. And that is cutting. Whether he had a crust of bread and some water. Whether he was adrift at sea, on the bank of a seashore, hungry. Not privation, no shelter, sparse clothing, being beaten. He says, I know how to be content in both. What was the issue? For me to live as Christ and die as gain. And that meant that Paul knew how to enjoy the good times. He knew how to enjoy the sparse times. His scale of values was right. To live as Christ and die as gain. That means Bible doctrine was number one. So what I want to say is under materialism lust, it's not wrong to have nice things. We have some really nice, we have a nice building here. We've got nice equipment, nice furniture. All of these things are nice. But guess what? We can also have Bible class outside. We've done it before. Under the shade of a tree and we can be content. We don't, we don't concentrate on having to have nice things. Doctrine is number one. So you overcome materialism lust by your scale of values and your list of priorities. That is, to live as Christ and die as gain. And Bible doctrine is number one. The one word, epithemia, translated lust, insatiable desire, it's the pressure in your sin nature calling you to action. It does not mean you have to obey. So materialism lust is real. It's things. Uh, things can't make you happy, obviously. And <clears throat> we should uh, recognize it's not wrong to have nice things. As a matter of fact, God may actually have for you nice things as part of his super grace package in your life. 
And uh, God can bless who he wants to, and he certainly does bless mature believers. The issue is, is that mature believers can be happy with and without. And so materialism lust is a true motivation in the world. People want things, and uh, they desire things, and it is a big motivation in life. Let's move on. Social lust. Jesus says it best in Luke eleven forty three. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the chief seats in the synagogues and the respectful greetings in the marketplaces. And so we're going to have approbation lust, which is closely related, but social lust here is that... Uh, Elevation in societal recognition or standards. In other words, uh, people may try to become a pastor because they want that social position. And I'll tell you, if you do not have the gift of pastor teacher, the worst thing you could ever do is try to fill that office. The Bible says the Office of pastor teacher is the worst form of slavery that there is. It is the huper, huper retes, huper retes. That was the under rower. That was the slave on the slave ship who was not on the top rung of rowers, but was chained in the bottom row of rowers where the slaves on that were chained to the upper row of rowers, the refuse from their bodies fell down on the huper retes. Welcome to the ministry. Don't become a pastor if you don't have that gift, and if you do, you better bear down on doctrine and get oriented to Bible doctrine. That's your only Savior. I was... Uh, <clears throat> Didn't take me long to get oriented, and uh, the fact that I lost all of my friends uh, once I started in the ministry was a eye opener. And I, what what was amazing about it was is that I asked my friends to help me. Uh, what what they'd say? Well, what is this deal about you being a preacher? And I said, Well, you know. I'm, I recognize my spiritual gift and need to teach the Word of God. I need guys like you to help. The phone hung up. I never heard from them again. And the list of guys that I asked to help me that have now died is very long. And you, you, I have to... I, see, the idea is, is that God placed them in my era of time to be in ministry with me. And since they rejected that, maybe he called them home. I don't know. But I have learned, like Paul, my best friend is now Jesus Christ. He sticks closer than a brother. He has never failed. He's never failed me. He's always there when I need him. He's always encouraged me to keep going. And uh, he has never uh, rejected me in any way. And while I may receive discipline, if I head in the wrong direction, his staff comforts me. You see that? He is my shepherd. And so social lust is a big problem. People want that elevated seat. They want that social position. They go out for politics. They go out for ministry. They go out for any and all ways to be recognized socially, including the Internet. And the, the more followers you have indicates how you have advanced in your social lust, and they figure out how to get followers and how to be an influencer. The approbation lust comes in likes. The social lust comes in followers. 
And so social lust is real. It's happening. It's a big motivational factor in life. And uh, the problem is, is how popular should you be? And um, I'll tell you, because I have uh, four jobs, I have not had to be popular in ministry because I never let my tools get rusty. I know I am in the era of, uh, of the rejection of doctrine. The Bible says the last days men will be lovers of themselves, boastful, proud, arrogant, haters of all that is good. That's my, that's my era. And therefore, I have not uh, allowed my tools to get rusty. I have to have a means of taking care of my family other than the ministry. If I was just in ministry, I have a feeling I would have to be a whole lot nicer. I have a feeling I'd have to tell a lot more jokes from the pulpit. I have a feeling I'd have to be a whole lot less coarse than I am now. I'd have to refine myself a little. But guess what? I'm still working, so you, you're in for it. All right? You have to forgive me for being a little rough sometimes. Wednesday night, I came in. I had been battling a grinder all day. It's like wrestling an ana anaconda. And I got behind the pulpit, and I was full of intensity. And I, I apologize for that. Maybe I don't. You'll have to go back and listen to Wednesday night and see what you think. Social lust is a real problem. People wanted that elevated platform. They want that social recognition. They want that label. They want that approval. They want that salute of their peers. And uh, it's a big motivational factor in life. Going along with that is approbation lust. That is the insatiable desire for recognition and approval. Jesus knocks it down in Matthew 6. He says, take heed that you do not your alms, that means your giving, before men to be seen of them. And in the old days, they had a big brass funnel that led down into the giving pot so that when you walked by it, you threw your coins in and it made a big loud clanking noise and it would clank, 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 clank until it went into the pot so you could make lots of noise as you threw your offering into the plate. And then it got to be such a big deal that they would line up and they would call your name and such and such has his offering today and he'd bring a big wheelbarrow full of coins and he'd start clanking them things in there and everybody'd get to clapping. Oh, look how much he gave. The only motivation behind it all was the recognition and approval of fellow man. He says, to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father, which is in heaven. And so we recognize that grace giving is God the Holy Spirit leading you on how much to give. And that the idea is here that you may want, you may deeply want to give and have nothing to give and you have given more than anyone. See, it's the motivation right here. I want to give a million dollars to ministry, I have two pennies. I'm giving it. And Jesus would say, as the widow threw her two mites into the pot and nobody clapped, assuredly she has given more than them all because the motivation was she wanted to give it all. She did. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, that means when you make your offering, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites, do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have their glory of men. There's approbation lust. 
Verily, that means point of truth, I communicate unto you. They have their reward. That means that's all the reward they'll ever have. It ain't counting in heaven. So, and I've given you Colossians chapter 3. There's the working man's monopoly. The <clears throat> That's the reason we have our offering box hidden around the corner. And we have the grace-giving policy right there beside it. And I want to tell you, at Grace Bible Church, we rely on giving. But we want mature believers to give because they have the right motivation. We don't want street walkers to come in and give. They don't have enough doctrine to give yet. We don't want unbelievers giving. They may think they're buying their way into heaven. We see we're relying upon mature believers giving because they've got the right motivation in life. And that's how our ministry is supported. So approbation lust is the desire for recognition and approval. And this can be a, this is a terrible problem in the local church. Look, stand up and pin the tail on the donkey is the favorite game to play in most local churches. Daily Bible reader, hold up your hand. Approbation lust. Uh, top givers, hold up your hand. Approbation lust. Uh, even on Mother's Day, youngest mother. I love that one. Man, it's always a terrible situation. It never was forecasted. And they make them stand up and they pin the tail on the donkey. Why are you doing that? Why? What's the motivation behind that? You've got all of these activities that happen in the local church, and guess what their motivation is? Approbation lust. There's no spiritual motivation behind it. And therefore, guess what? At Grace Bible Church, we won't be pinning the tail on the donkey. And we want you to have your reward Therefore, we don't do a lot of name-calling along the way. So the inordinate desire, insatiable desire for approval, this can go so far that people commit suicide in order to gain that platform that they revealed in life. In other words, no one is paying attention to me now. Let me go ahead and commit suicide and then they will know who I am and I will have the recognition. And so you see how terrible it can become. Now, do you see the importance of Bible doctrine in your life? See, God knows you personally and he knows every problem that you've had in the past and now that you're now dealing with, he loves you intensely and he wants to hear from you. And therefore, don't throw your, way, your life away that you may have the recognition of men. Approbation lust is a, a bad thing. You need to learn about it. Sex lust. Matthew 5, 28, Jesus says in the Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount, but I say to you, that means I communicate this doctrine unto you. This is, uh, this is obviously, he is outlining the millennial kingdom in which he is offering to Israel. This is a good point of doctrine. He says that whosoever looketh upon a woman, he's talking to the men in the crowd, to lust after her, that means to have sexual intercourse with her, hath committed adultery with her already in his right lobe. So he's looking at the married men, by the way. They're in the audience. So you have to stop here and you have to uh, get some information. And the truth is, is that 
Uh, sexual sins are prevalent in our society. Fornication is sex before marriage. It happens a lot. It's uh, actually the order of the day. There's no problem with it except for the Bible. Uh, adultery is sex outside of marriage, your right partner. So that's what Jesus is speaking of. The other side of the situation is, is that there is the recognition of, of beauty. There's the recognition of symmetry. And I want to give you a prime example of that. I said earlier that Paul personally attended the Olympic Games, the Pythian Games, the Isthmus Games, and that was a modern form of entertainment in his day. And that during that time, the athletes were, uh, they were required to attend training, a training camp. And during this training camp, they had to make the roll call every morning, the trumpet call, and that every athlete would emerge many times before daylight, and whether they were a distance runner, a shot put thrower, a boxer, uh, any of these athletes, any and all of them would have to attend every practice. And if you, did, if you didn't make the trumpet call, you're disqualified. And that, uh, that when he says everyone must be temperate, that is what he was saying in 1 Corinthians. You all have to have discipline to show up at roll call. And <clears throat> every athlete had their clothing. You know what their clothing was? When they showed up, they, were, they had their uh, PT. There are people who took care of them, and they were pampered, and the, they all had to eat the same food and drink the same uh, drink, and they all got the massage and uh, everything that they needed to be able to compete. But do you know what their uniforms was? What they practiced in every day and what they competed in. It was all and sand. That's it. And by the way, these, these athletes were, they were pristine bodily. They were the ultimate in the uh, human realm when you began to look at the human body. Uh, they would have had very little fat, would have had lots of muscle. They would have advanced in the uh, physical realm. They would have been full of symmetry. They would have been very athletic, yet naked. And Paul went and he watched the Olympic Games, the Isthmus Games, the Pythian Games, and every one of these events, the athletes were completely naked. So you have the issue in the Christian way of life. Can you appreciate symmetry? Can you appreciate beauty? Can you appreciate the human body? without, as Jesus says, falling into sexual lust. And I'll give you the bridge between the two. You can recognize beauty and have a fine time doing it and be an appreciator of the human body without falling into sex lust by, by not saying, I would like to get into bed with her. You simply recognize the Physical attributes. You recognize the symmetry, the high cheekbones, the wonderful skin, whatever it may be. And you do not go into that area of sex lust where you want to crawl into bed with that other member of the human race. So you have appreciated it without lusting over it. Are we okay? And see, that's where Bible doctrine gives you the answers. Don't gouge out your eye. Did you know that many men, it, this verse goes on to say, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. And some man has seen some beautiful woman and he has felt like, 
well, maybe I've got a problem here. And he gouged out his eye because he saw a beautiful woman. Isn't that terrible? See, we can rec recognize beauty. We can rec recognize symmetry. We can recognize athleticism without falling into sex lust. Okay, I want to thank you for your attention and attendance this morning. We're going to study all 12 of the lust patterns of the sin nature. And we'll <clears throat> continue that next Sunday morning. I'm going to pray with you, but don't, don't run off because I want to do a roll call before we leave. Let's bow our heads together. Our Father God in heaven, we thank you for your word. Because of your word, we have answers for life. We have clarity. We have meaning, purpose, and definition. We thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you for your attention and attendance. You are dismissed.